So, hi, I'm Timothy Snyder. This is the latest of my little talks about current events. It's the 29th of May, 2018. What I thought I'd like to talk about today is the European Union. Most of what I've done thus far is talk about Russia or talk about the United States, but the European Union, in some sense, is more important than either. Its economy is bigger than the American economy. Its economy is eight times bigger than the Russian economy, at least. It's the most important collection of contiguous democracies in the world. And unlike Russia and unlike the US, it doesn't really have a clear story about itself and it doesn't really have a clear profile, at least in the American news. So what I wanna to do today is talk about how this notion of inevitability becoming eternity or the absence of history, how this affects the European Union. Now, if you're European, you're probably going to get your back up when you hear someone with an American accent talk about how Europeans have a problem with history. But you, you do. I'm, 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 I'm stopping myself from saying y'all do, which is a code switch, which I won't use with you Europeans. So you, plural, do. And the, the problem has a couple of parts. The first is that there isn't a European history that's common. So just as a matter not just of historiography, but of pedagogy. European school children going to European schools don't get anything like a European history which allows them to recognize one another as Europeans. I'm saying this on the basis of teaching Europeans at the university level for more than two decades um, in the US, but also in European institutions. It's just the case that students from Finland or Portugal or Poland and Denmark or Germany and Greece don't have a common history. It's, it's actually worse in Europe than the United States if it comes down to that. The second way that Europe doesn't have history is that much like in the United States, there's been a substitution over the last 25 years of the notion of memory for history. And the, the problem with memory is that, I mean, obviously mem we talk about memory when we don't remember anything. It's, it's, a, it's a classic Freudian type situation where the more you talk about something, the less you have of it. So when we talk about memory, what we don't mean, we don't mean things we actually remember. We don't mean historical detail. What we mean is a kind of public culture of remembrance or the things that we're supposed to remember. Now, the problem with that is that memory is even more national than history is. So Portuguese or Spanish or French or German or Polish or Ukrainian memory is going to be, is going to tend to be even more contained and even less subject to translation than national history is. So where we are in the early 21st century is that we have a bunch of national histories that are taught separately. And then on top of that, and in, in some sense making matters worse, is the cult of national remembrance. Okay, why does all that matter? If you've come with you this far, you know, dear Europeans, dear Americans, dear others, why does it matter that there isn't European history? Well, because how we think about the past and how we think about the present and future may be the most important political issue in the world right now. Or to put it in a slightly pompous way or pretentious way, the most important meta-political issue. If you don't have a sense of history, then you become very vulnerable to the kinds of myths that I've been talking about the last couple of years and have been writing about in Road Done Freedom. The myth of inevitability, that everything's going to turn out right or the myth of eternity, that you're doomed no matter what you do. What the road to unfreedom means is going from a sense of progress to a sense of doom, going tr from a kind of blithe, sleepwalking story about how there are no alternatives and therefore what we're doing is gonna turn out okay, to a catastrophic story of how everything has surprisingly gone wrong and that we used to have a good history and now someone's taken that away from us. That shift is common to Russia, it's common to America, but it's also common to the European Union. And what I'd like to do in the next few minutes is show you what it looks like inside Europe. So where do we start? What's the European politics of inevitability? What's the story that Europeans tell themselves? What's the thing that is believed under the skin? What's the thing which is axiomatic? What's the thing that Europeans take for granted? The thing that Europeans take for granted is this. It's, it's, I call it the fable of the wise nation. Europeans take for granted that their nations have been around for a long time, that those nations have had nation states for a long time, that the nation states have learned from the past 
that the main thing they've learned from the past is that they've learned from the Second World War that war is a bad thing. Therefore, European nation states chose wisely on the basis of this wise experience to form uh, a, a policy of integration which led to the peaceful European Union of today. Now, that is an extremely convenient story because for one thing, it allows Europeans to look at Americans and say, we've learned from war and you haven't, which is of course very comfortable. Another reason why it's comfortable is that it blocks out completely what is actually the truth or the central truth of European history, which is that the 20th century or the long 20th century from the 19th to 21st is not about the nation state at all, which hasn't really existed. It's about European empires around the world falling apart and the fragments of those empires, the European metropoles, what was left after empire collapsed, those bits, those European bits coming together to form European integration. Now, let me try to take this a little bit slowly because the idea that Europeans never had a nation state is on the one hand factually totally obvious, but on the other hand, the nation state is so embedded in European memory and in European pedagogy that it takes a few seconds to try to extract it. So I'm gonna take a few seconds to do it. Think of the big European countries, the big European histories. Britain, France, Germany, Italy, Portugal, the Netherlands, Spain. All of these major European powers with their broad and impressive and very interesting histories have something in common, which is that they were empires. Britain was an empire, uh, the, the French were an empire, Portugal, Spain, empires, the Dutch empires. These are all maritime empires. These are maritime empires built from the 16th century forwards, which collapsed in the middle decades of the 20th century, the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. There is not a moment in the history of those countries where they were a nation state. It just didn't happen. The process of the empire falling apart takes place at the same time as the beginning of the European integration process. Or to put it a different way, trade all around the world as it becomes more difficult and as it collapses is replaced by trade inside the European Union. This happens in Great Britain in the 1960s. Great Britain joins the European Union in the 1970s. Now you might be thinking, Germany wasn't a big maritime empire. And that's true. Germany is the most important case. Germany couldn't be a great maritime empire. What Germany tried to be instead under Hitler was the last frontier empire, the last empire to conquer great amounts of territory. Hitler very consciously, but by the way, looking at the American example, thought that he could build up Germany as the last great European empire, but over territory by conquering Poland, by conquering the Soviet Union, above all by mastering Ukraine. Now, what this means is that when the Germans fail at that, when that they lose the Second World War, the lesson, the most important lesson is empire is impossible. Germany has to be European. This is of course what Konrad Adenauer says. Germany has to be European. There are no alternatives in that sense left. And so when Germany, along with France and Belgium and the Netherlands and Luxembourg, begins the process of European integration, they're just confirming this general lesson. When you can't have an empire, what you have instead is, is Europe. So what the Europeans have done in the last 50 years or so, um, 60 now, is they have brought together the fragments of shattered empires into this thing called the European Union, meanwhile telling themselves that it's just nation states making a choice. That story is entirely false. There are never nation states don't appear on the stage at all, at least in Western and Central Europe. But it's a very comforting story. It's a story which gives you continuity. It's a story which allows you in your schoolrooms to talk only about yourselves, which is always fun. And it's also a story, and this is maybe the most serious point, it's also a story which allows you to completely sideline the atrocities and the humiliations of losing imperial wars. The, ma the main thing that happens, or one of the main thing that happens in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, into the 80s, is that European powers lose wars across Asia and across Northern Africa. Um, that we just completely remove from the story and talk instead about how we learn from the Second World War, the nation is wise, the nation has made good decisions. 
entirely false, but a good story. Now, if you're an East European, you might be saying, well, wait, we did have nation states. And that's true. You did have nation states, but this, this is the exception which confirms the rule. Poland, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and a few others, these were indeed nation states in the 1920s and the 1930s. And this confirms the rule. These nation states lasted for around two decades. All of the new nation states created after 1918, every single one of them collapsed in the late 1930s, early 1940s. All of them were overcome um, by, by larger powers, the Nazis, the Soviets, and in some cases, both. And as soon as these places emerged from communist rule in the late 80s, early 90s, the first thing that their leaders said, because their leaders understood at that time their own history, the first thing their leaders said was, we have to get into Europe. The process of forming a state was the same thing as the process of going into Europe, which is where I want to now go in the 21st century. There was a tremendous confusion in the European Union about the relationship between the European Union and sovereignty. From a neutral, objective, cold historian's point of view, what the European Union seems to have done is permit sovereignty. What it has done is it's taken all these imperial fragments the metropoles of the old failed West European maritime empires and um, the, the weak um, threatened nation states that emerged from Soviet empire after the 1980s. It's taken all these fragments, all these bits, um, central or peripheral as the case may be, and it's put them into something which has actually allowed enough trade and enough economic prosperity and enough general contentment however one measures that, to permit sovereignty, whether it's British sovereignty, Portuguese sovereignty, or Polish sovereignty. Or to put it more sharply, the main myth in, inside the European Union is that, well, we would be a sovereign nation state, except we gave some of our sovereignty to Europe. I think it's actually the other way around. If it weren't for Europe, there's no particular reason to believe that any of these places would be sovereign. And the reason why a historian suspects that is a historian looks back at the history of Eastern Europe and says the sovereign nation state existed briefly and collapsed, or looks at the history of Western Europe and says the sovereign nation state never actually existed. The European Union in both cases is a kind of rescue mission for sovereignty. So the way that Europeans are vulnerable, vulnerable to shifts in time, or vulnerable to illusions about history, is that they have a politics of inevitability which says we have a nation state, it was old, it was wise, it made good decisions. If you think that's true, if you think you have a nation state, if you think the nation state's been around for a long time, if you think the nation state makes decisions, then you misunderstand what the European Union is about. And you can think, well, since we decided to go in, all we have to do now is decide again whether we're going to go out. The problem with that is that then the whole discussion of whether to be inside the European Union, whether this is in, about Brexit or about any other member of the European Union, the whole discussion gets warped. In Brexit, nobody, and I think, I mean, literally nobody, there are more than 70 million British subjects, nobody, more than 80 million now, I think, not a single one of them said, hey, wait, we've never actually been a nation state. I think it's fair to say Nobody said that. And that seems to me to be a critical point in the debate. The debate was about, should we be inside Europe or should we be a nation state outside Europe? But nobody pointed out that Britain had never been a nation state. The whole discussion was, well, if we leave Britain, then we can return to some warm, familiar sense of being Great Britain. That's nice. That's comfy. That's appealing. But it's totally mystical. It's not actually based on any historical experience. Great Britain has never been a nice, comfortable, intimate nation state. It's never happened. Great Britain was a world power. It was the greatest power in the world. It was a maritime empire. It won the Second World War. All true. But as an empire, not as a nation state, it's never been a nation state. As it lost its imperial possessions, it integrated into the European Union. So Brexit, and I'm just using Brexit as the most important example, is not some kind of loop back into a comforting past. There's no such thing as a loop back to a comforting past, nice as the idea is. It's instead a step into the abyss because nobody knows what a British nation state would look like. There's just no history of a British nation state. 
And therefore, there's, in my view, there's no presumption at all that after Brexit, a British nation state would exist. Why should we think that it would when it never has? Isn't it more likely that after leaving the European Union, further changes involving Ireland or involving Scotland or even involving Wales would then ensue, leaving us with a whole bunch of different nation states? And why would we expect that Britain would be more sovereign outside the European Union than within the European Union, if the historical function of the European Union has actually been to guarantee, and in my view, to magnify sovereignty. It's, it's, I think, lazy mentally to just assume that as soon as we get out of a relationship, we're going to be stronger. It seems much more likely that after Britain leaves the European Union, it will A, cease to be Britain, and B, the England that's left over will be much less strong vis-a-vis the United States, vis-a-vis China, vis-a-vis Russia, and by the way, vis-a-vis the European Union, because you're much stronger vis-a-vis Europe inside the European Union than you are outside the European Union. So I give Brexit as an example of a general problem. All throughout Europe, whether it's France with the Front National, or whether it's Germany with the Alternative for Deutschland, or whether it's the governing parties of Poland and Hungary, we have this idea that somewhere back in the past, 1930s and 1940s usually, we were a nation state and and perhaps we should go back in that direction. This is a temptation and in my view it's a it's a dangerous temptation. And as I've talked about in chapter three of Road to Unfreedom, as I've talked about elsewhere, the one country that truly understands all this is Russia. And so the way that Russia plays Europe is by appealing to this subjective sense that yes, there was this comforting past, perhaps we should go back to this past as a nation state, which is why Russia supported Brexit um, with, with bots and otherwise. It's why Russia supports the Alternative for Deutschland in Germany with bots. It's why, it's why Russia uh, loans money to the Front National in France. And it's why Russia supports, by way of the internet and other means, the forces in Central Europe which are pushing against the European Union. Because the Russians understand just what I'm talking about. They know that the European Union, it doesn't have a history of nation states. They know that it has a history of empires. They know that this is all a trap. And they're pushing Europe back towards what I call the politics of eternity. They're just taking a ball which is already spinning and spinning it just a tiny bit more. As with the United States, what they do is they see a subjective or a psychological weakness inside Europe, which is already there for its own reasons, and they just nudge it in a particular direction. So what does this mean for Europeans or what follows from this? Can I do something besides just criticize? I I will briefly and then I'll be done. The, The first thing it means for Europeans, and this is very simple, and I've been saying this for 25 years, It would be really good to have a European history for all kinds of reasons, for Europeans to recognize one another, for European leaders when there's a moment of crisis not to fall back on appalling national stereotypes, which is what happens all the time, but finally as a kind of form of political security. If you don't have history, something else rushes in to fill the gap. Something else will, something else, some myth of progress, some myth of doom. So history is a kind of political self-defense. That this, so why not have a common history? Why not just have European high school students read a book, which is a good book? Why not have them read Tony Jutt's post-war, for example? Why not pick out a text which is good and critical and have all high school students read it their second year in high school? Why not? Um, the, the second thing which the European Union has to do is that it has to have some idea of the future. And this may seem paradoxical since I've been talking about history the whole time, but since Europe... Europe's politics of inevitability, this notion that everything is always going to be fine because the nation is wise, because that's not true, because the politics of inevitability is never true, you can't count on it, right? It's, it will eventually break. People will eventually become dissatisfied. Their faith in the future will eventually dissipate. That's happening now. You have to have some vision of the future, which appeals especially to the younger generation. You can't just say, Europe is going to go on you know, because we're a wise nation and we learned from the Second World War, because A, the young generation doesn't care, and B, that was never true in the first place anyway. So you have to have some idea of how Europe is going to be appealing, and you have to have some measures, like exchange programs, whatever it might be, whereby young people associate their current lives and their future lives, their families, the children they're going to have, the jobs they're going to have, with Europe. Not some grand story necessarily, but measures which help people between when they're, say, 15 and 30 
think of their lives in, in European terms. And of course, it's encouraging that some European leaders, like Macron, for example, seem to be thinking in those, in those terms. Okay, so thanks, thanks for your patience. What I've been trying to do here is explain how this general shift from inevitability to eternity is indeed general. It's not just about America. It's not just about Russia. It's also about Europe. And also try, try to explain how Europe is threatened and what Europeans might be able to do um, to rescue the good things which integration and the nation state have brought them because those two things go together. Thanks a lot.